morning from beautiful Honolulu. This is Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Overconsumption. Anybody know what overconsumption is? Think of maybe not your garage, but your neighbor's garage. Can the car fit into it or two cars? No, it's full of stuff. And that stuff consumes the Earth's resources. That's what we'll be talking about. It is overconsumption heating the planet. Back in a moment. We have with us Dr. Gail Grabowski, Chaminade College, and she has with her three distinguished students. Don't they look distinguished here? And we are going to talk about their own youthful views of what overconsumption is. Just want to give a graphic example. We've seen, or I've seen, a lot of fancy cars out on the road lately. Jeeps, four-door four Jeeps with all kinds of gadgets, everything all over the place. Those things cost around $60,000. You can get a perfectly good new car, all the bells and whistles, for around $20,000. Bending gap. $40,000 and more, you're going to take a loan out on that $60,000 car and you're going to be paying it and paying it and paying it until the car is ready to be traded in again. You're losing all kinds of money. Question, what if you are a parent and instead of spending that extra $40,000 on that fancy car, you had dedicated it to your children's education? What a concept. That means if your children are well educated, they're going to earn easily an extra million dollars during their working time. Just a little thought on overconsumption. And on that very cheery note, it gives me huge pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Gail Grabowski, who will introduce our distinguished students. Take it away, doctor. Thank you, Howard. That was great and fun. And I'd, I'd say even, boy, the cars in our garage, you know, what a wonderful thing we invented that had all these unintended consequences. And to your point that you just made, why do we want that much more expensive, fancier car over just a car that works or a car that we share or a car that we call up on a phone or a car that's called a bus or a bike? Yeah. So with no further ado, I'd like my students to introduce themselves for this uh, fun, controversial, but very important topic. My name is Kobe Nidalem Song. I'm from Palau. I am a fourth year environmental science major. And my thoughts on overconsumption is pretty much uh, within the word itself, just buying way too much of one thing and most likely not using some of those things. Yeah. And for those of you that haven't been to Palau, it is an amazing place that's very much aware of consumption, very much aware of how important uh, the natural environment is to well-being and all the uh, ecosystem services it provides. Thanks, Kobe. Hina. Hi, guys. My name is Hina Iwane. Um, I grew up here in Oahu. I'm from Palolo Valley, and I'm a third year majoring in environmental science, minoring in environmental studies. Um, growing up here in the islands, we just learned to take what we need, not more. So I feel like this topic is going to be really good and really exciting. And it's a good thing to talk about. And so and then we'll get to the crux of how do we decide what is a need versus a want? And uh, our last student who introduced herself will have something to say from that about that from a psychological perspective. Alex, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Alexandra Boyce. I actually grew up in Chicago, um, but now I'm going to here at Chaminade University. Um, I'm a junior psychology student and my minor is environmental studies. And from a psychological perspective, there's of course biological need that consumerism has been able to support. Um, but as we've grown and as social norms have changed, We've changed what we wanted based on things like status and um, wanting to have power and wealth. And that is has a lot to do with why I think we overconsume so much today. And that that uh, Alex alluded to something we talk about in class. Back in the day, all of our ancestors were hunters and gatherers and you couldn't have a bunch of stuff. 
because you were typically on the move. There was very few places on the planet where you could actually stay put and collect things. So the notion of wealth was not even tied to products. It was tied to you and your character and your abilities and your knowledge, your skill, your ability to entertain, the quality of your character. So it's a pretty new thing that we're doing right now. Um, Alex mentioned the psychological underpinnings. We need to look into that more deeply because they're really interesting. And for those of you that watched the Super Bowl yesterday, um, I have my students watching the ads now. Um, we'll use them in class to say, how did that ad motivate you? In what way did it try to get you to buy whatever it was, a car, a beer? You know, what 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 tools did they use to either you know, play on something we already have in a sphere or the desire to be loved or status or wealth? Um, or did it did it scare us, you know, into it? Or did it did it use some other motivation? But just to talk on the upper high level right now, we are motivated also by our economic model that we live under under capitalism. And we use a measure which everybody's heard of, GDP. So I think it's so common people don't even know what it means because we just call it GDP. And it stands for gross domestic product. We can also measure gross net product um, or gross national product. And this is basically a measure of how big our economy is. How many, how much stuff are we buying and selling? And one point I'd like to make is that other uh, there are other measures. There's one called social progress indicator that does include GDP, but it also measures our health, our freedom, our communication, our education, our environment, et cetera. And then there's even one that's even more focused on overall well-being. I shouldn't say more, but is so focused on also our psychological well-being, and that's gross national happiness, which is measured in Bhutan. And it has nine parameters of which all of us would say, that's really important. That one is really important. So we're also kind of forced or coerced from above to consume. And when I say above, I mean from governments and from just, we just grow up in a world of advertising. So um, don't, people out there shouldn't feel too guilty. We're born into it and you have to detox. I grew up in Southern California and I would spend all my money that I spent in high school, all of it, all summer. I'd work all summer and then I'd buy clothes and I would spend it to nothing. You know, I didn't save up for college. I said, I'm going to be an athlete. That's what I'll get to school. But why did I want all those clothes to be popular or to be status something? So don't feel like it comes from within. It comes from without. So guys, um, let's talk about why we buy. Because the reasons we have are the same reasons probably that most of the audience will have. So whoever wants to start first, why do we purchase things? Yeah, um, I would. Um, there's a term in, psych, uh, in psychology. It's pervasiveness of social influence. Mm. Um, and it's just how much we are affected by other people. And some of the social psychology principles are wanting to be connected to someone or seeking out me and mine. So like you said, not all of them are bad. Sometimes we want to buy things that make us feel a part of a group, or um, maybe we're buying something that helps us express our personal identity. So those aren't necessarily bad things, but they're definitely motivators of why we maybe consume so much. Alex, do is there data that young people, you know, who aren't established, right? They're, you're trying to make a living, you're, you're young, you're, you're fledging, you're out in the world. Do young people, they have more of a need probably to purchase the basics. Yeah, get a house, say. Um, do, do they does this taper off as we get older the desire for stuff that's a good question i don't want to give you a solid yes or no because i i don't know the research on that um if i were to speculate i would say young people maybe have more of a want to belong because they're just starting to maybe find themselves so maybe that could influence them wanting to buy more but i wouldn't want to say necessarily that it tapers off either i think the motivation to buy is probably lifelong yeah yeah and so there is something natural to it, you know, the the Maslow's triangle, which I know you'll explain, Alex, just having enough needs to be safe, you know, the basic needs that every human has. But there is good data out there that above a certain level, we don't get happier. <laughs> so here we are using resources because very much of the GDP is related to extraction from nature of one sort or the other, whether it's water or wood or metals. Um, but we just um, we just 
it doesn't even help. So we're doing a thing that may not even be better for us, although we are hearing how good it is to have a growing GDP. Now, if that was not based on stuff, it would be fine. If we could grow on ideas and services, that would be fine. But it's growing on on large large part. And these days, it's also growing on disaster management and cleaning up after tornadoes and hurricanes. And that one always makes me sad. And we talk about in class that GDP may go up with the train. Personally, we try not to buy a lot of stuff. So back home, we live about five minutes away from the closest grocery store. And if you take a look at our fridge, it's mostly empty because everything has an expiration date, right? So we just buy whatever we need for dinner and we just plan out like what we're going to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we buy all those things we need for that day. And if we're out, we just go ahead and buy more. Of course, um, there are like down, like drawbacks to that. Like we'll have to buy more gas due to like, driving both to the store and back home. But that's more of an investment for us because we're trying our best not to produce as much food waste. Yeah, so not all shopping is bad. Not all shopping is good, but it's really just the habits that we can practice uh, on a day-to-day basis. So Kobe, is that part of your family's reason for doing that is just to decrease food waste? Nice. Most definitely. Yeah. So yeah, we farm a lot of our food, like breadfruit, papayas and whatnot, taro, all kinds. And we fish a lot. So we don't really need to go to the grocery store as often. Only a few days at a time yes. will we visit. And if it's on the way home from work, and we forgot to buy something, then we'll definitely stop by for it. But other than that, really, we try our best not to shop as much. Very cool. And Cole, um, so so you're showing us another really good thing to do, to buy local, which is a big movement here in Hawaii. It's in, And for the topic of the show, right, emissions, you know, from airplanes are one of the, one of the major sources of greenhouse gases that contributes to warming. So Um, one more reason to buy local. That's the major reason to buy local. Besides, it makes local business. And here you are growing stuff, which is really cool to know because it keeps you connected to the importance of resources and the soil, you know? Um, Kobe, one more question. Is there a lot of packaging in the stuff you buy? And if so, what happens to it in Palau? Is there a landfill? Do people try to burn it? What's the scoops on that? So actually, when buying groceries, uh, like fruits and vegetables, you can see like farmer, farmer's markets like all around and they hardly pack anything. They just put it on tables, make sure it's uh, completely untouched by unwanted pests or they ha- have like refrigerators or anything to keep it like completely stored at the right temperature that it needs. So really they don't come in plastic bags. Yes. We tend to bring our own bags with us and then just put it inside. If you really wanted a plastic bag, you could ask them for one, but most of the time, no one really asks for it. That's exciting. Um, we need to go be able to go back to that. COVID really made it hard to not package stuff, right? Because everybody was afraid of touching things um, for good reason early on. So, um, so that's awesome. So an awareness of not packaging and Pacific islands are facing issues of solid waste disposal, what to do with that stuff. So that's, you guys are aware to not get that started because once you got a pile of stuff, like we know on this Island, it's hard to find another place to put it and it doesn't go away and it makes methane, which also contributes to climate change. Ah. Um, Hina, Hina, why do you shop or or talk about it? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Personally, me and my family, we're still working on lowering our consumption. But um, when I go out, I do a lot of the buying for my family. So we mostly get things that we need. But on our end, or for me personally, it's the impulse buying that gets me. Like I'll be at the store having to get something already. And then I'll see, oh, I want that or oh, I want this. And then I end up getting it. Yes, I am trying to work on that, but it's day by day, you know, one step at a time. Um, we, another one. Hmm? Go ahead. Go ahead. Another one that I am trying to lower is 
we do eat out a lot. So we're trying to buy more groceries, buy seeds to do farming, like Kobe them. That's really good. Um, and also just buying local and whatever you do have, try to reuse it as much as you can because it helps. Thank you. And guys, one thing to point out is we are not at all anti-business. I mean, we love businesses. We all depend upon businesses. It's more a matter of the policies that guide the businesses. Like if we had policies for less packaging or policies for what's called cradle to cradle, like thinking about the full life cycle of a product um, and developing infrastructure to deal with the full life cycle. So we showed in class another day a, a town that is a zero waste town in Japan. They recycle like 43 different things. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of thinking. I mean, we need business and we love business. It's just that the way we're doing it needs some, and we can't expect businesses to you know, minimize, you know, try to sell less. That's not what's going to happen. And we can also make more money perhaps on services. Services are great. They don't use as much resources. So Alex, tell us some of the subversive, you know, psychological techniques that advertising uses to get us to buy. Yeah. Huh. Like Hina mentioned one, retail therapy, which we're probably all guilty of or take pleasure in, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um the advertisers, they know what they're doing. Um, they definitely know psychological techniques to get you to want to buy something. Um, I think the number was seven to eight percent of the revenue is spent on advertisement. And I just looked up the one for the Super Bowl yesterday. It was, I think, seven million was the average for a 30 second advertisement that they, they spent on. So they know what they're doing. They spend the money to make sure they get you to buy the product. Um, one thing I found that was interesting was McDonald's, their colors, red and yellow, actually stimulate you to feel hungry and to feel happy. So you associate McDonald's with hunger and happiness. Yes. Um, so that's just one of the examples. But advertisement is truly everywhere. And it, you can't escape that advertisement. I was home over Christmas break and I actually had an Oreo with an advertisement on it. So I was eating someone's advertisement. It's crazy. So it's everywhere. It is. We, we, from the time we're little kids in America, we're going to see stuff that we want. Yeah. I think there's some new regulations out to try to like, don't sell little food to little kids on little kids shows. You know, you're going to show them, feed them sugar. Yeah. That's what they're going to want because they can't, you can't blame them. Um, Alex, what about other things? Do they try to scare us into buying things or make us feel like we'll be beautiful or handsome? Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, absolutely. So there's um, the reciprocity. Uh, that's one of the techniques. So if you give some, if the company is giving you something, you're more likely to want to give in return. Um, or there's the foot in the door technique, where if you agree to a smaller thing, you're going to want to, or you'll be more likely to agree to a bigger thing. Um, what you said about status, definitely they use celebrities and advertisement to make something look attractive and say, oh, I want to have status like this celebrity. Um, so I'm going to buy the product to be more like them. Um, yeah, lots of different techniques. Yeah. So everybody think of a celebrity that does an ad. You guys got one in your head? Who do you got, Kobe? <laughs> um, the first person that comes to mind is Ariana Grande, and she does a lot of makeup. Ah, yes. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Kina, what do you, who, you, who did you think of? Um, I actually thought of two people. I thought of Colin Kaepernick from a long time ago for his NFL ad, but I actually thought of Rihanna because she just did um, the Super Bowl halftime and she, what do you call it? She does Fenty ads. What's Fenty? That's how old I am. Fenty is her makeup line. Oh, so two makeup lines. Okay. Yeah. Um, Alex, who did you think of? I thought of Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah, yeah. um, he does super funny ads and he seems to do so many various types of ads. And I think that definitely is playing into um, a, a psychology principle. And probably a lot of what we saw yesterday at the Super Bowl was like silly things that are going to make you laugh and keep your attention for an advertisement. They're going to they're gonna make you watch it and then be happy with the product. Yeah. Be happy with it. And then you'll be remembering that ad later on. Yes. So it stays with you. Now, I was thinking of Jason Momoa, who does an ad that's very good for nature. Yeah. So the celebrity, 
the celebrity trick can be turned either way. Also of J-Lo and Jennergy. Yeah, it's a cute ad. Um, so that one shows you health. Try this and you will be health, healthy. Um, so guys, switching gears just for a sec. So, so if we look at economics, I think Herman Daly, who, who was the World Bank's economic a, a, a economist for a while, now he calls himself an ecological economist. He points out that while our economy may be growing by GDP measures, it might we might actually be harming nature in a way that affects the quality of our air or the quality of our water, you know, decreasing wood so that we have less trees, so that we have more climate change. So he says we're just not doing a true accounting of costs. And if we did, we would realize the sweet spot where consumption is basically level with what we can do in a recyclable way. Um, and he would call that a steady state uh, economy. And so. You know, it's a hard thing to think about. We can get there faster if population shrinks because then we can all consume more and stay at a steady level or keep consuming at the rate we are now. But if population's growing like it is now, now it's slowing, but we got to 8 billion, you guys might know, in uh, November this year. Um, when I was born, there was 3 billion. And in 1800, there was 1 billion people. So even with, uh, he says that back in the day, early on with economics, the world was full of natural resources and people scarcity existed in terms of what people had. Now we are full and nature is becoming scarce. It's a really neat way to explain it. Um, guys, let's turn, let's turn the tables now, turn tides and help people figure out what can we do, yeah, to consume less, but to have maybe more joy in life or just as much. So what are the alternatives to our current rates of consumption? Anybody want to weigh in on that? You know, you're ready. I can tell that. I well, <laughs> the one thing that comes to my mind is just reusing because what Dr. Gil I well, <laughs> the one thing that comes to my mind is just reusing because what Dr. Gail said about um, like throwing stuff away. Throwing stuff away is one of the last things you want to do. You want to try to reuse it. You want to try to repurpose it. Um, if you have a lot of plastics, plastics are really hard to recycle. And a majority of it actually doesn't get recycled. The trash in a landfill, only, only a small percentage of it actually gets like um, incarcerated and like be able to reuse and stuff. A lot of it just sits there to decompose, but it takes years and years to decompose. So reusing it as much as you can goes a long way. And yeah, I just repurposing stuff is really important. Yeah, there's that really nice triangle of solid waste, what to do. And the bottom mm -hmm. one is dispose of it. The top one is like you say, re, we'll think of avoid it. And I hate to say that because we don't want businesses. We want businesses to do well, but good products you don't have to avoid, you know, and then then recycle, reuse all those things. Yeah. Hina said, cool. OK, Kobe, what Kobe and uh, Alex solution. Personally, I would like a steady state economy, but one where everyone's successful and there's lots of well-being and there's lots of equity. There's lots of distribution that's that's equitable. So but that is a hard nut to crack, not to stop trying. So, guys, what are you thinking of in the now? As of right now, I'll just think of trying not to buy as many brands because like, for example, a water bottle, I use a water bottle like every day, but there are so many different types of water bottles and with so many different price tags on it, but it ultimately has one purpose, which is to carry liquids in. And I just bought a simple water bottle that can keep my um ice cold for the entire day without having to put more ice in it and that's perfectly fine for me i don't need another bottle i'm going to stick with that until it actually breaks and that that is when i will buy a new bottle to replace it very good cool kobe and now that we save energy because you're not using the energy to make ice over and over again someone is yeah cool alex what you got solutions what can we do yeah, I think those were great ones, Tina and Kobe, um, making sure you're educated on what to buy. And um, there actually was a great article um, uh, published by the American Psychological Association that said people are happier when they're paying for an experience with um, 
people they connect with over buying a possession. So maybe switching our mindset to buying so much products to possess into paying for an experience to have with people that we're connected with, I think would be good. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I think I'll add, um, let's adopt some Pacific Island values. Pacific Islands are places where resources are clearly finite. And so all these indigenous people in the Pacific figured out ways to make sure there were fish, you know, consistently. And they we, they also didn't have available, like we all do all over the world now, the ability to like over harvest tuna till they're rare. You know, we're so smart. We are sometimes too smart for our own good. So let's focus on some values that people from some places where sustainability was was a challenge and was accomplished. Let's learn from them. And we've got about 30 seconds. Anybody want to chime in with the last words of wisdom? Consume smarter. (laughs) (laughs) Consume less. And just apropos of local food, uh, generally speaking, that local food is much, much higher in nutrients than Uh is uh, farm-based food from the mainland. Oh, that's cool. Another reason to consume it. Nice. And that brings us, unfortunately, to the end. We just got really rolling on this this subject. I, I had some real good tidbits, but no time for that. So thank you, Kobe. Thank you, Hina. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Doctor. And we will see you in two weeks. Aloha and fond adieu. <laughs> Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.